which I want to take is on initial public offerings. And uh, initial public offerings are very popular among the investors. And uh, most of you, even if you are students, if you have participated in the stock markets, it would be through IPOs. Because mentally, you feel that IPO is very safe. Secondly, you are not entering the stock market, you are just filling up a form and applying for an IPO. That this thing keeps the elders happy that my son is not getting into the stock markets. And uh, IPOs are very popular because one is you don't have to really use your head or do anything. When an IPO comes in the market, you believe that, okay, let me invest in it and I'll make some money out of it. IPOs are always associated with profits. Now, what I want to show you over here is understanding the behavioral anomalies of human beings, of the management, as well as the investors who invest into IPOs. And initial public offering, as the name suggests, is totally opposite of exactly what is an IPO. Now, why does it or why are we so much interested in an IPO? Because it is known as initial public offering. So it's something new. We always want to get into something new which is a novelty. Secondly, in an IPO, it has no track record. So normally you believe in the value of mystery and you are willing to pay, you are willing to follow the Pied Piper because there is something different which is going to happen. We all look forward for some sort of adventure, some sort of interest in life. Most probably, most of these issues come. It's about a new industry in the offing, a new technology. A drug having, uh, uh, I mean, a uh, pharma company having launched a uh, new drug in the market. There are so many reasons <coughs> where investors rush into such stocks. Because the lure of the new, the lure, the lure of mystery is so much that people are willing to pay much more higher prices for something which is unknown rather than what is known. And IP also comes in the lure of the new. Because here also, okay, the company does not have a track record. Normally all IPOs would come with something new and people get excited by it. Now why do companies come with IPOs? First is the initial thing for what an IPO was discovered was to raise resources from the market. Secondly, because certain things happened because people were willing to invest whatever money they had into such markets, unscrupulous management also try to come and take money from the unsuspecting public. As we have always mentioned, when investors are irrational, when they are just looking at making a fast buck, you have a lot of people a lot of management would try to capitalize on that. When investors are willing to pay a fancy price, that's also when IPOs come. If you have realized that in bad period or in bearish period, hardly you will see any IPOs in the market. It's only in bullish times IPOs. Because why bullish times? Because investors are willing to pay a very stupid price for any piece of paper which comes in the market. So IPOs come with an idea to capitalize on the greed or the irrational behavior of the investors. Normally in an IPO what happens is when a company is taking birth, there is normally an angel investor who comes in first. He is the person who is really taking the risk in the IPO. Then. You have different types of, when the, when the company starts growing, 
company starts doing a little better then you have different types of investors in the form of venture capitalists p coming in and uh, they are the ones who really make the money when do they sell this is only when irrational investors are willing to pay a higher price for it <clears throat> now let's consider some of the psychological errors which we have seen and which we have studied in this past two days which work in an ipo one is the base date information only a single singular information is given to you which is extra, uh, extrapolated too much into the future secondly is you have an underpricing heuristic that whenever an ipo comes investors are always under the impression that it is underpriced and we will get there will be some money left on the table in bullish times because people make gains on listing they conclude that there is always money kept on the table but why would someone keep money on the table why would an angel investor why would an uh, 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 the owner why would a venture capitalist put some money on the table so that you earn why do they come in bull markets they come because that time you are willing to pay any stupid price for the stocks so you have these two psychological errors which are working which will clear up as we proceed through the presentation secondly is the psychological uh, this thing errors are recency and the herd instinct the recency effect as we have seen is whatever information is fed to you every day and your decisions are dependent upon the recency effect of all the advertisements all the talks you hear about an ipo so you have a lot of noise being created by an ipo campaign secondly dreams are being sold to you why i would say dreams because it's something new the value of mystery is at its highest so people just go on talking or selling you certain things which is very difficult for you to judge at the initial stages it is something what we did in the chapter on nudges that you are not sure of the experience you will get this thing when the time comes when the event gets fructified another gray market premiums you must have all about heard about the gray market premium what happens in a gray market premium because there is a lot of euphoria in the markets about an ipo because a lot of people are interested in that there exists a gray market which is normally being created either by the company management or by the investment banker because there has to be you know like sometimes they say we don't know how the gray market appears it does not appear out of smoke there are people who try to manipulate that market and uh, i don't know you must not remember morgan stanley had come out with a close ended public issue i mean a close ended fund a close ended fund is you collect money from people there is an x amount of money which is collected the uh, the shares of the uh, fund units were uh, given to you at about 10 rupees deducting all the expense of the issue that's uh, 10 rupee would quote somewhere around 9 rupee 50 paise or 9 rupee 70 paise it cannot quote more than that however a big gray market was created because of the irrationality of the investors that that share in the gray market had touched 20 rupees there is no way a close ended fund can touch 20 rupees but this shows the irrationality of the investors secondly people start following the pied piper is a pied piper could be a strong brand in the markets it could be a big merchant banker or it could be a big operator trying to sell dreams to the investors now what's happening is ipos once upon a time 
were controlled by the controller of capital issues. So when a company wanted to come out with a new public issue, they had to go to the controller of capital issues. The controller of capital issues would decide on the pricing of that issue. And when that government agency was taking care of it, they definitely left money on the table for the investors. They were, because that was a time in the late 70s, uh, I mean, the, yeah, late 70s, when Hindustan River came with a public issue offering shares at 6 rupees premium, a 10 rupee share. That time you had all the multinationals like Digital, Hinditron, uh, Gillette, they all came out with about 5, 6 rupees premium and where people made a lot of money. However, with the liberalization process in 1991, the full system was abolished. The, con the office of the control of capital issues was abolished and a free market pricing regimen came into play. So even the fact that we are using the word IPO is a wrong thing to use because in a free market where IPO can be priced at the market rate, there is nothing initial about it except it is coming first time in the market. But from an investor point of view, there is no change. Either you buy one stock which is quoted in the market at a good price or you can buy this IPO. They both are on the same level. Another is the representative bias which comes in an IPO phenomena. First is IPOs always come in bull markets. In bull markets the prices are always going up. So people always go on making money on listing. So IPOs become representative of profits only. Secondly, IPOs will always come in the market where a certain sector or a certain fancy is existing in the market. Like when you had during the tech boom, you will have IPOs of only tech companies coming. Then about last two years back, when you had a real estate fancy, you had real estate stocks coming into play. Then uh, infrastructure stocks came. So you are going to see all these sort of representative biases at work whenever an IPO comes. In fact, this was so evident, uh, the IPO story in 2006-07 was so strong that even mutual funds, they came out with new offerings calling it IPO. Now they were using the word IPO as a representative bias to uh, tell investors, you please put into that. And investors are always irrational, especially when they are in the herd. So everyone went into new offerings of mutual funds also. <coughs> Secondly, you have a round trip fallacy working over here. All successful people are hard workers. All cheap stocks are low PE stocks and all IPOs are profitable. If all successful people are hard workers, that doesn't mean that all hard workers are successful. But you have a round trip fallacy working over here where people start believing that any IPO is a profitable opportunity. Secondly, let's consider the role of the investment banker. Now who is an investment banker? Is the one who gets the IPO in the market. Whenever a IPO is going to come into the market, whenever a company wants to offload its shares in the market, first is the company management will only offload when it's getting a good price for what it is selling. So actually the company management is thinking now my uh, stock is overpriced, let me get rid of it. And the markets are good. When they call markets are good, what does that mean? That the investors are crazy. Because only when investors are crazy, then the markets can be good. Otherwise, if the investors are rational, markets can never be good. So they appoint a merchant banker. They pay the merchant banker. Then the merchant banker judges the market conditions and then requires that at least this price will be able to sell it in the market. The company haggles with the merchant banker and there is always a performance fees which is kept over there. The higher the price the investment banker is able to get, the better the fees they get. And the funny part is that investors 
हैव टू ओनली गो थ्रू अ मोर्चेंट बैंकर हैव टू ट्रस्ट द मोर्चेंट बैंकर हु हैज बीन अपॉइंटेड बाय द कंपनी इट सेल्फ एज आई टोल्ड यू इन्वेस्टर्स ट्रस्ट द सेम मोर्चेंट बैंकर रीड हिज रिपोर्ट गो ऑन हिज एडवाइस नोइंग फुल्ली वेल दैट हीज बीन अपॉइंटेड बाय द कंपनी पेड बाय द कंपनी for the company uh, for, for the merchant banker to get the maximum price for the company now he is a selling agent for the company and the investor believes that he is one of the best investment advisors morgan stanley they had couple of big investment bankers and you sold something which was next to impossible to sell like a close ended mutual fund at a premium how can you have a premium on that but these are the ways of the markets where people are able to manipulate not that the problem is out there the problem is with the investors themselves you can see you got into uh, you have got into morgan stanley okay <laughs> uh, okay so what's your question that time also morgan stanley it was a mutual fund it was a close ended mutual fund and uh, they had also appointed investment bankers yeah morgan stanley see suppose if it is a close ended mutual fund you just come out with a issue well this is morgan stanley is a good fund management house they are coming with a close ended fund it will not be listed but they appointed investment bankers because they wanted selling agents and at that point of time the argument was where that morgan stanley is new in india and they would require the merchant bankers and those merchant bankers they think played havoc with the investors in fact till date morgan stanley has not come out with any new issue because their uh, uh, brand name took such a bad beating and uh, a lot of senior people in india lost their jobs of course they retired multi millionaires Wrong that close-ended fund means they get a premium. Yes. Why is it not? No, it's always there. In any company, uh, they saying it is. You know why this happens? Uh, this is because <clears throat> of the irrationality and the noise of the markets. Noise of the markets. And ev- in every country, a close-ended fund after listing, it will always quote at a very big discount. Now, actually, if you see a close-ended fund, what is the value? of the stocks which are there and what it is quoted so suppose if uh, uh, if it has been issued at 10 rupees and if it is a close ended fund it would uh, they say if the value of that is 12 rupees in the market it will cost uh, they saying uh, will be quoted at around a discount of 15 to 20% always always and before it comes when the value of the mystery is at its highest it is quoting at a premium now that is what what the morgan stanley fiasco shows is how stupid the investors can be and here the stupidity is not because of anything else now if you are a wise person sitting on the buy sides and understanding this you can definitely benefit from other people's irrationality stupidity whatever you call and most of these market prices are because of the noise which is created in the markets and the noise is all empty noise sir yeah the while the two hundred fund quoted a discount to its irrationality of the investors its irrationality the because it is listed it is listed and how the investors think is when is it getting uh, matured or when it is when is the life span ending so till date they will get so much money from the market today they will not get so they are willing to give a discount only to buy that so a wise man would always pick up uh, things at a discount i'll tell you uh, uh during 1997 uh the i know about this because i bought this based on this bhl anomaly it 97 98 morgan stanley was available in the market at 7 rupees which included a dividend of about uh, 50 paisa or something like that No, no. It was uh, at seven rupees, and uh, they saying if you calculate that the uh, net asset value of the stocks which it held, it was twelve rupees. Twelve rupees, and you are getting at seven rupees. 
So, if you are a long term investor, these are the actually values. Once we go tomorrow into the value investing part, it's here you have values which anybody can see. Anybody, it, it does not require rocket science, it does not require a genius to really go through your finances. But they are always there available to you. Only thing you should be able to see where. But what happens is, if it is at 7 rupees, if you don't believe in your own thing, then if you don't have self-confidence, then you start questioning, well, the people know better than me, that's why it is at 7 rupees. Other, how can it be at 7 rupees? Now market pricing. <clears throat> if it is market pricing, there are 7,000 stocks listed on the market. Why should you get into an IPO only? Then you see which other values are available to you. Why an IPO? <clears throat> market sentiment is also deciding the price. That's why they come in bull markets, they don't come in bear markets. Because in a, in a bull market, they get a higher price. Secondly, they only come when the sectors are hot. As I just mentioned to you, real estate, they, all of those, when the hot sector or the fancy in the sector is there, people, they, I mean, uh, uh, companies try to cash on irrational investor behavior. <coughs> Secondly, whenever people invest into IPOs, they are not investing into the stock or into a business. They are investing with an idea that on listing I will get the gains and I will sell it. Now, although we call it investing, it is not actually investing, it is trading or you are just punting. <clears throat> Reliance power example is a fantastic example. I am mean, taking that example just now. Now, let us see some of the data. Microsec financial retail portion subscribed about 11 times. Eros International Media 26 times. Career Point Info Systems 32 times. Met with a runaway retail response. Do you remember any of these names? Yeah. This is vaguely remnants of a frenzied market of 2007 when IPO allotment was seen as prices to be secured and every IPO was thought to be a sure fire, uh, fire listing bet. Long term underperformance. IPOs check. If you knew all these companies, check their prices today. They think you are losing in all of them. IPOs come when the demand is only strong. Strong demand again leads to higher pricing. Higher pricing again leads to low returns. Because the higher money you pay for an IPO, your returns are going to be less and less. So there is no way that being with the herd in the initial stages of an IPO, you will be really able to make money. While the Sensex has almost made it back to its January 2, 2008 highs, nearly 40% of the 2007 IPO stocks are still in the red for their original investors. This was in business line. Now this is another price performance study by Care Research. A unit of rating company Care shows that 62% of the 116 IPOs between August 2007 and August 2010 are trading lower than the sale price. India's biggest share sale by Reliance Power in January 2008 has left investors poorer by 40% now. Adjusted for bonus. So was this case with the India's biggest real estate developer DLF whose shares have fallen 30%. Future capital holdings is down two thirds from a sale price of 765. Okay, now we will just take a case study of Reliance Power IPO. Now, I don't know how many of you have a background of the Reliance Power IPO. Okay, some of these people. Okay, so I will just cut. It was a new company which was formed by Mr. Anil Ambani. And uh, Power was a fancy that time in the markets. And he had already... Reliance Energy, which was a power company, he already had that company with them. But that company, it was very difficult to really pick up this thing, good, 
amount of money from the markets because it was already a listed company so it would not create any euphoria among the investors so what was done was he promoted along with reliance energy he promoted a new company where 45% of the stock he took at 10 rupees 45% of the stock with his holding companies like reliance energy and all they took at 10 rupees and the rest 10% they went for a public issue because the markets were crazy markets were willing to pay anything for power stocks so he came out with a 10 rupees share they saying at a premium of 430 to 450 rupees <clears throat> company the new company which they had had a mere profit of only 16 lakhs of rupees <clears throat> but it had something very important that was brand of reliance that was most important and uh, Overconfidence was so strong that only one saw advertisements of Reliance Power powering in India. That's all. There was no other advertisements because no other advertisement could be given because there was nothing in the company. There was nothing. It was only a they think at at a 16 lakh profit, it was sold to you at some th somewhere around 5000 p. If anybody did their maths, they would have known that it was around 5,000 p. The issue was heavily oversubscribed, ultimately to be called the mother of all issues. Now, investment banker. Who's who in investment banking circle was the investment banker of this highly priced IPO? Everyone, you name every foreign credible bank which had an investment banking arm was over here and mind you they were all working free they were all working free because they only want to be associated with the name of reliance so actually with such a big brand you think that he's going to take their advice for the pricing of the issue there was no pricing of the issue every investment banker who gave a higher price that will be able to sell at this price he became the darling of the company oh see he's telling this here so ultimately he made them into competitive bidding and then everyone started telling no we'll get this price we'll get this price and then ultimately they decided at a price which was actually decided by the company the investment bankers were just over there just to the league i mean the statutory requirement that you require investment bankers so ultimately in the guise of investment advisors, he had only selling agents who were working for him. Huge fees I've written is what we would think, but those people really don't pay fees when their issues have to be managed. They know what you have to do. What made it a big success? One is it was in the power sector. Brand Reliance, Dhiruba Ambani. Whenever you saw the advertisements, it was always Diru Mamani, Diru Ambani. <clears throat> totally bullish markets were there. Greedy investors were there. Aggressive selling by the investment bankers. And a grey market premium of about 1000 rupees. This was the existing scenario before the public came out. In 2007, December, this was what was happening. Now, let's see what were the heuristics which were working over there. All the available information to the investors was Reliance was powering India. Secondly, the India growth story had made the power sector very hot. Because we all know if India is going to grow, what will require? Will require power. And there were not enough power plants over there. And Reliance Power powering India. I think it was a fantastic advertisement campaign latched upon the investors who thought nothing that if India has to survive, then Reliance Power has to survive. And Reliance Power can only make India survive. You know, it was uh, it was one of a masterpiece of advertising campaigns. Representative heuristic. Since power sector was hot. Reliance Power 
became representative of the hot sector. So it became a representative of the word hot. Oh, that means Reliance Power is a hot sector. <coughs> All power stocks at that time were quoting at high multiples. There have been so many people talking about that this is not the right investment for anybody to make. In spite of that, that company became the mother of all issues. Secondly, how did other re representative bias work? In new issues of NTPC and power grid, which were just before about 6 to 8 months before, when they were listed, there were a lot of money on listing gains. But investors forgot that those were not highly priced over inflated issues. Those were companies having a reasonable track record, a reasonable profit, a reasonable balance sheet and they have, uh, they think the listing was there. I mean the listing gains were there. And definitely the power hot sector was always there. But investors thought if you could make money in government companies like NTPC and all, how much can we make in the private sector? Grey market premium of 400 to 500 rupees. That means when you had, uh, when they had issued at 450, the price was about, uh, they saying 900 to 1000. So Reliance Power was IPO was a representative of, of a good power stock as well as a good IPO. An IPO in a bull market always represent profits. <coughs> then. If so many people were writing about it in the newspaper that this is a highly inflated price, then why did the issue become so oversubscribed? Actually, if you go to see every investor whom I had talked to or a lot of other people were talking to, investors understood that this is a highly priced stock. Lack of corporate governance is there because a lot of our projects were transferred from Reliance Energy. With all these factors, and investors were always thinking, I'm going to be smart, I will sell off my stock. I know I'm buying something which I should not buy, but I will sell it off on listing. So everyone was thinking that I'll make money on listing because even if the premium is 500 rupees, how less can it go? I don't mind even if I get 100 rupees premium. They all were thinking that way. And they all were anchored to the grey market premium. Grey market premium is 450 to 500 rupees. How much can you go? Even if I get 50 rupees, I am very happy with it. Everyone was thinking, if everyone comes to sell, I will, uh, they say, I will still get a good premium. So everyone was buying because everyone was buying. And everyone was thinking that he is going to be the first one to sell on listing and make a profit. So everyone who invested over there actually were just punters. They were not buying a business. If you are a real investor, you got to be buying a good business. But they all were just trading. They were buying a stock which was expected to give them profits. So when you hear in the markets about uh, something is happening to an investor, first you have to ask whether he is really an investor. Because a good investor saying, really does not see the... Uh, the BSC or the NSE screen every day. Investors only invest when businesses are available at a good discount to the intrinsic value. So here you had all traders, all punters who wanted to make a fast park. They all were thinking that we'll sell on listing and all came together to book their profits. Now if everyone comes together to book their profits, what happened? There's no way there was any buyer over there because every one of them was thinking that this stock cannot work. The same herd, the same investors who made it the mother of public issues made it one of the worst laggards in the history of the Indian markets because no stock has gone down so drastically from such a, uh, they think, a good brand. Actually, at the, uh, they think, when it was listed, there was only greed and fear which was evident. Before that, it was agreed that everyone will make fast money. And when the listing came, ultimately it was only fear. 
as I told you, only 10% of the shares were offered to the public. Promoters of Anil Ambani and Reliance Energy offered themselves each share at 10 rupees. This, you cannot have a worse greed than this from people who are already having all the money in the world. Public were offered between 430 to 450. And what he did was, this man, he only destroyed the strong brand of Reliance. If Dhirubhai Ambani would have been there, he would have seen that the investors made money. He would have offered this stock at around 100, 150, be satisfied that this much money I am still, it's a great money I am getting. He would have kept money on the table and today Reliance Power would have been very different than what it is today. Because whatever happens in the markets, when you really think, fool the investors over a period of time, they think you will have to pay for it. Today if you see all the ADAC companies, they think, they are all beaten down, totally. Because stock markets are very unforgiving. You may find the fickle mindedness of the investors, but once your brand is destroyed, it becomes very difficult to coop up. So sometimes, Mr. Anil Ambani would not have even realized that he would be doing this damage. But sometimes people become so greedy that they don't know what they are doing. And that's why it's better to have the right investors, I mean the right advisors with you. He had who's who was an advisor as a merchant banker. But none of them give big advice, good advice to him. Sir, yeah. In, uh, at the time of this issue, I, I remember that there was a rumor in the market that the Reliance Group of companies, they were a employer group of operators to actually come and buy shares to prevent the price from falling to a particular level. So, they kind of, so investors uh, traditionally had, they say like, Ambani ke saath hai, that kind of mentality, uh, because of their operator, I don't know this. See, I tell you, whatever the operator cartel is there, they think, when you are in the financial markets, when money is involved, they think, there is nothing like telling sorry. You have to pay the money, that's all. You can't tell, oh sorry, I won't do it again. No, sorry, you pay money. And when money is involved, involved, this is, there is no integrity level, especially in the financial markets. I have been a part of the financial market for the last 30 years. I can tell you that. Cartel, or what happens when everyone comes to sell? Which cartel will? Be able to, it's not gone are the days when Dhirubhai Ambani was there with his company because his success was prior to the liberalization. But this was after the liberalization process. That time everything was controlled, you could control everything. In this sector you can't control. Well, Anil Ambani also made that mistake. The thing he had grown up with his father, he thought the same times existed, but times had changed. If times change, then new strategies are required. You cannot go on doing the same things, expecting different results. That's the definition of insanity. Trying to do the same things over and over again, expecting different results. You cannot have different results.